Hey there everybody, Pete here from Comic Book Geezers. Welcome to another edition of Inside the Cover. As we're continuing on a little bit past uh, October, the Thanksgiving season, uh, to bring you just a few more horror and monster related comics before we jump right back into the whole superhero thing as we normally do. So you get some extended play on the Halloween season here because you know Bill and I both love horror and monster comics and we know you guys do too. So uh, humor us a little bit as we continue on with this theme for a little bit longer. Today we're going to take a look at a book from Marvel Comics. We're going to go back to 1969. Issue number two of Chamber of Darkness. Look at that great cover. Enter the Red Death, as most of you know, these uh, horror and monster comics, uh, either from Marvel or DC, were almost kind of like anthology books, right? So you had multiple stories in there, sometimes new stories, sometimes uh, reprints of stories from the 50s and the early 60s, and uh, Chamber of Darkness was no different. So uh, although these, I believe, are all new published uh, stories, these were not reprints to my knowledge okay so let's take a look at this so again this is issue number two are you tired of being skinny because you know you can get gains up to a pound a day proven by thousands by drinking this cool looking drink you get the kit all of a sudden you're looking like that with those two hot women flanking your side because that's the way it works right so here first story uh is actually forewarned is forearmed Okay, so this is not the cover story, the first story. So here you've got, and you've got, uh, Gravely is the name, Headstone P. Gravely. Here's your host for this story up at the top, the guy with the hat. Kind of looks a little skeletal, right? So he's the one introducing the story. This particular uh, uh, story here is all about a guy in prison. All right, so here his name is Carl Brook, sorry, Carl Brock. Stiffened as the mocking metal door clanked slowly open, he shivered as a cold, clammy draft stirred the tepid air of his darkened cell. Yet he shivered not with cold, but with fear. So basically, it's a guy in prison. His name is Carl Brock, who uh, you see him in his cell, which is being opened now by one of the, uh, the guards, as well as it looks like a physician or a doctor. So basically, uh, there he is, Doc, a good riddance. He gives me the creeps the way he hasn't opened his mouth since they brought him back here. Bring him along, guard. I have a feeling he'll talk to me. Well, we'll see. So they bring him clawing and scratching out of his cell. Okay, and they're going to take him over to the warden's office where he's going to have a conversation with the warden and the doc, right? Because they want some information out of this guy. Uh, stop struggling, Brock. You don't know how lucky you are. The best head stringer in the state is going to have a go at you. He struggles and fights like a wildcat, but he doesn't say anything. The doc says, perhaps he will change his mind, my friend, when we reach the warden. So when they get into the warden's office, uh, it's basically the warden, the doc, and Brock. And they got a tape recorder going. Uh, the tape recorder's ready, Warren. Let him begin, Dr. Carruthers. But I don't know what good it'll do, even if he does talk. The man's a hardened criminal and a paranoid to boot. Then all of a sudden, he, Brock opens up his mouth and starts talking. He goes, paranoid, huh? Well, I've got a story to tell you. Once I tell the story, everybody's going to want to be talking to me. You'll want to let me out of here, right? So he's going to tell the whole story about how he escapes I guess recently, right, because they don't really give you a timeline, but it was fairly recently before this little meeting here in the warden's office where he escaped from prison, captured a gun, right, from one of the guards, and somehow got beyond the prison walls, escaped into the woods. So as he escapes in the woods, he sees like this strange ship in the sky above him, which lands right near him, and he's like, holy cow, what's going on? And out from the spaceship comes this strange humanoid looking being with four arms, crazy boots, a helmet on his head. He's like, what is going on here? It looked a little like a man, except it had four arms and was wearing these big weird boots. Never said a word as it floated near me. Right. So then, uh, of course, we got a little ad there. Right. OK, the race to danger. And then just as he as the, the creature comes forward to him puts this contraption on side on top of brock's head all right even if i had the backbone to fight this creature it would sure would kill me on the spot then it was too late to fight it put this fishbowl thing on my head and pow i had two minds it sounds crazy i know but it's true that guy's memories were my memories and mine his i saw and remembered his world his universe, as he saw it, it was like a giant hand grabbed my gut. That's how scared I felt when I saw the things he had seen. I saw his planet with its burning red sky, and somehow I knew it was doomed. 
He and his fellow creeps could change their looks like we'd change shirts, but I knew they couldn't hide as it got hotter and hotter. Like rats leaving a burning sawmill, they went off into space to wait until scout ships found a new home, a place like Earth. So we've kind of seen similar themes before in this series where we looked at some of these kind of sci-fi horror stories where you have beings from another world who have to leave their planet because it's unhabitable or they've been attacked, they got to go somewhere else and they want to come here and take over Earth, right? So basically next... Um, He's still getting his mind read by this creature, but somehow he takes off this helmet, smashes it, throws it at the alien, shoots a couple shots, runs away. Of course, he's scared shitless, so what does he do? He runs into uh, the cops, all right, after another altercation with the alien chasing him. He comes across the cops who are out looking for him, and he's basically like, take me, take me, take me. Got to get me away from this crazy alien. You know, put me back in custody. Uh, I'm all for it. You know, I've never been so happy to see a cop in all my life. And from that moment, that's when he got kind of silent, right? So they threw him, threw him in, the, in the pen and whatever. So now back to the present. So the doc turns off the tape. He seems to be finished telling his story. He looks exhausted, and the warden goes, Thanks, doc. I hope I haven't wasted your time. I'll have Brock taken back to his cell. And Brock is like, Back to my cell, just like that. Is everybody nuts? Can't they see I was telling the truth? They got to believe me. They got to believe me, right? And, and so the warden says to the doc, goes, Please call me immediately after your work on the tape, after you're, you're done working on the tape. So they can analyze the tape, listen to everything he said, right? Of course, warden. Back to the cell, he uh, Brock is like, I gotta convince him. Only an hour before they take me away, they gotta believe me, right? So, the inter that's the interesting thing here. So, all of a sudden, like the doc has to. Sorry for the glare, guys. The mid afternoon. Um, so the doc has got to analyze the tape. Why would they have to analyze the tape? That should automatically uh, lead you to think that something's amiss here, right? So uh, again, some ads. So on the next page. We see the doc back in his office, right? The psychiatrist returns to his room. He was anxious to take proper care of the tape so that he could safely call the warden. So the phone rings. Uh, yes, warden, I put the tape through all the tests, but the results are still all gibberish. And then the, the warden says, well, then that's it. I'll notify the proper authorities. It's unfortunate that your theory didn't work out, warden. The warden says, if Brock's voice speed had been somehow sped it up so as to be unrecognizable, it would have been a scientific first. But as I said, excuse me, I'm lighting a pipe, right? So he's talking on the phone and lighting a pipe. The warden goes, ha ha, doc, you must have three hands to do that while you're talking on the phone. Uh, yes, an uncomfortable maneuver at best. And then as you look, you notice that the doc has four arms, right? He's there lighting his pipe, talking on the phone, manipulating the machine, the whole nine yards. And down below, you see the uh, our Mr. Brock. He's actually going, to, I guess he's going to be put to death or something like that. And the moral of the story is basically what you're hearing here is that in this meeting with the psychiatrist and the warden, the psychiatrist was actually the alien. Because if you remember earlier, Brock said that once he was doing the kind of co-habitual mind thing, he saw that these alien creatures could overtake any, any appearance. So basically what he did was he made sure that when Brock came to that meeting to be recorded and tell his story, that everything that came out of his mouth was so nobody can understand it. So that's what he recorded. He was able to manipulate that uh, and actually then show his true form. He is actually one of the aliens. And now Mr. Brock can never tell what's coming from the the aliens from another planet right so he's going to be put to the put to death for whatever his crimes were they don't really say that and uh and then the alien race can take over uh, the earth right so that's 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 the end of that so basically here comes another here comes brock to add to the din at the loony bin and i was so sure i'd have another customer from my casket emporium oh well better cousin digger will turn up some something suitable in the next story so in the next story we actually have uh this is called the face of fear all right, so story by Stan Lee, art by Archie Goodwin, uh, script by Archie Goodwin, art by Sid Shores, lettering by Gene Izzo. Uh, so here you have that story, okay? And basically you've got a father talking to his son. Remember, this is 1969, so picture a teenage kid in 1969, of course, 
the height of the psychedelic era, long hair, funky clothes, maybe growing beards, wearing jewelry, all that kind of stuff, and parents being very conservative, wanting the kids to cut the hair, all that kind of stuff. So that's what you have here. No or more arguments, Freddie. You're going into that bathroom and shave, or you're not leaving this apartment. I've tolerated the long hair and crazy get-ups, but I won't have you looking like one of the Smith brothers. It's my face. I, why can't I grow a beard if I want to, right? So, of course, here's the argument going on between father and son okay and of course you got uh, our host kind of taking a look here so basically the father basically bullies his son into going into the bathroom and shaving that beard all right okay so he finally relents the kid finally relents uh, but he looks into the mirror and the mirror is all foggy so he can't really tell what the hell he's doing so uh so Freddie's looking he can't rub the steam off of it, right? He's like, what's going on? He sees this face. He knows it's not his face. He goes, who is that? Is that someone else? It can't be. That face, that creepy face, like looking at death itself, staring, grinning, almost as if it wanted me to know it's a trick, some kind of trick. Dad, if you sneaked in here to try and scare me, no one behind me, it's not a reflection. It's real. Who are you? What do you want? Why do you keep looking at me like that? Stop it. Do you hear me? So the next thing he does, takes his razor, smashes it into the mirror. I'll smash you, destroy you, get out of here to someplace a thing like you can never reach me again. All right, and then we got the Saturday morning cartoons on ABC, right? Some of you remember those well. I certainly do. Uh, and then... So now he must he got to look back, got to reach the elevator, got to get out of here. So now the kid's freaking out because he keeps seeing this apparition now. Now the apparition's come out of the, the mirror, right? Uh, can you truly escape that cadaverous countenance which now haunts not just the mirror but your own mind? Why doesn't it come? What's taking it so long? He goes outside the apartment to the elevator. Uh, somebody's been always holding these things just when you need them. So come on. So he calls the elevator. Elevator comes up. He's got to get out. The door opens. And what do you know? There's the apparition, the creature in the elevator this is like a bad nightmare right i mean uh so he goes leave me alone please leave me alone he goes running away running runs to the stairs and everywhere he looks he sees the apparition okay can't escape it can't escape it then he gets goes back up goes and looks at the elevator that he was going to get and he sees all sorts of people staring at the elevator he goes the elevator the one i was going to take a terrible thing someone says someone who's surrounding the elevator felt like a shot 18 floors thank heaven no one was inside something must have made whoever stopped it on the 18th floor change his mind whatever that was lady it sure saved him from never being able to change his mind again the face it wasn't out to get me but out to warn me so basically uh, I let its appearance fool me, just like I always complain about my folks doing. Maybe they aren't so different after all, but that face, what happened to it? Is it through with me? Is the danger over? Uh, or will I go through my life looking in mirrors and wondering? So basically, the moral of this story is that apparition that he kept seeing was not trying to scare him. It was trying to save him and get him to not go in the elevator because look what happened to the elevator. Obviously, something happened with the mechanism and it crashed 18 floors down to the bottom would have killed him if he got in so now for the rest of his life he will be wondering and wondering uh what is he actually looking at in the mirror so and i think last but not least right yeah, last but not least we've got uh, the day of the red death and that's uh, hosted by stan there's stan lee right there so another story of uh uh, what is this one? It's about a, a kind of a rich guy who wins at everything. Okay, this is a basically a retelling of the Edgar Allan Poe Mask of the Red Death, just in uh, you know more modern times for 1969. So you've got this uh, you've got this guy named Rupert who just basically wins at everything. Here he is winning at cards, right? Um, more ads. Uh, He's trying to become like the most powerful guy out there. And uh, he, behind the scenes, he's working on all sorts of, you know, like scientific warfare, things like that. And then, you know, he's got these people all around him. And uh, they are trying to, they got this masquerade party, okay? And 
then of course you know you want to unmask so you've got all these people at the party unmasking but you've got this character here uh, the outlandish the red death itself I never gave you such an outfit, you fool. Take it off at once. Didn't you hear, Mr. Griswold, George? This means now. So he won't unmask eh? or even deign to speak to us. Then maybe we should show him our own idea of black humor. I think we all understand you, friend. After him. So they go and chase after him. They take off his mask. And, of course, his face is red, just like the mask, right? Uh, yes, and you know what that means, don't you? The red death walks among us, touching each atom of air we breathe. In your hand, the, the control switch is off air off my air filter. Then we'll all die, even you. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Why? Because we're evil, all of us. Because not one of us deserved to live to be the new Adam. Deserve far a desolate world, a dead world, than one ruled by us. Don't you agree, Mr. Griswold? So that just kind of goes back to the early story. I know this one is kind of a little convoluted, but basically all of the this group of friends, this, this guy, uh, Rupert, and all of his friends just trying to do anything they can, whether it be in work or play, to get one up on other people and to try and take shortcuts on things in life, right? So this is basically... Coming back, uh, too bad about Griswold and his gang, isn't it? Especially since it turned out that nobody was killed by the Red Death outside a 20-mile radius. The world didn't really end that day, or hadn't you noticed? So, out of the three stories, easily the worst. But, kind of cool anyway, because it's like a, a take on the Mask of the Red Death. Finish high school at home. And are you looking for people who like to draw. So there you have it, Chamber of Darkness number two, Enter the Red Death, some interesting stories in there. Uh, another look inside the cover, as we got the mid-afternoon sun coming through the blinds. Uh, thanks for watching, I am Pete Pardo. Uh, make sure you subscribe if you haven't already, and uh, click on that notification bell so you get alerted of all of our content. Uh, Wild Bill and I are getting together this weekend, so we'll have plenty of new videos for you, starting off next week, so stay tuned for those. Inside the covers, uh, as well as uh, uh, while Bill and Kirk actually went out into a, a little comic convention a couple weeks ago, so Bill's got some stuff to show off that he purchased. So uh, new acquisitions day, so that should be coming up, I think, next. So stay tuned for that. More, I'll also, I'll also have some more inside the covers. We're going to start talking, go back to superhero stuff. I know a few of you asked for more uh, extended storyline arcs, so we're going to try and do that. We're going to go back to the inside the covers, but look at like successive issues and things like that. So uh, lots of stuff coming. So thanks for watching. I am Pete, and we'll see you real soon here on Comic Book Geezers. Take care. Bye-bye.